back to another episode of Handloader TV. And in this episode, we're continuing on with our series on World War II small arms. And my good friend Mike Venturino is here to help explain some of the stuff and just talk about these neat old guns. He's also the author of Shooting World War II Small Arms, a great book, and I'd encourage you to check it out. So we got two iconic, legendary World War II firearms here. The M1 Grand is iconic. It, it is. People virtually worship the M1 Grand, and rightly so. Mm -hmm. It was probably the best battle rifle fielded in World War II. At least it was the best one fielded in significant numbers. Right. Uh, there were some advantages to the Soviet SVT-40, to the German uh, GK-43, but the Grands held the ground. They, they, they were made in enough numbers. In fact, they were made in impressive numbers. The Springfield Armory, January 1944, produced 100,000 in one grand. Wow. In one month. That was their top. In one month? In one month. That is, that is unbelievable. Yeah. They were running full tilt. Uh, think about this. How much old scrap pine would you have to have to build the crates to make crates to ship 100,000 M1 rifles. It must have been a massive undertaking. Yeah, yeah, no kidding. And Wow. Only two manufacturers produced M1 Grants during World War II. Springfield Armory, which made about seven out of uh, every eight made. And then there was Winchester, which made probably one out of every eight made. Really? Yeah. The, it, they made... Three and a half million of those, and we Springfield or Winchester made about five hundred thousand of these. Well, wow, that's yeah. a that's a big difference. Yeah, of course Winchester was also making a ton of other things at the time for the war effort, but right, uh, it's still interesting. And uh, it was revolutionary. It was semi-auto rifle, firing what is technically known as an in-block loader. People call them clips, that's okay, but they're not clips. An in-block loader goes in the gun with the ammunition. At the end of the firing, the in-block loader leaves. Uh, the magazine is a gun that, uh, uh, apparatus that attaches to the gun, but the clip is thrown out when the gun is loaded. In-block loaders go in with the ammunition. And stay in and stay in until it's empty. That's an interesting little tidbit, and I like that because you hear them oftentimes even referred to as N-block clips, and, mm -hmm. and that's something I even personally have misreferred to them as, you know, so that's good to know. Well, I do too. It, when you grow up saying something wrong, it's really tough to diff, uh, improve on it, but that's the case. Yeah. So and you, as it's well known, they ping when they empty out. I would love to hear your thoughts on that because there's a lot of uh, discussion about that, discussion, shall we say? Yeah. <laughs> uh, here's the deal. And if you're fighting at a distance, the ping makes no difference whatsoever. My uncle, who I talked about earlier in one of our episodes, was on Guam fighting in the jungle, Bougainville fighting in the jungle with M1 Garands. He said, we fought sometimes at 10 feet apart. From the Japanese mm. and he said they would attack if they heard a ping they would attack and try to ban that you really yeah he said that to me he wasn't a BS artist he was a down-to-earth man uh, he said so we learned to do the buddy system nobody had two empty guns at the same time you had you and your buddy one of them always had a loaded gun for when the Japanese would attack. He said they did that. They could hear that ping in the jungle because he said they were so close. Right. So I do believe the ping was effective uh, in giving away your position in jungle fighting. I think in Europe, no, nah, it didn't happen over didn't, there. Didn't matter much there. Mm -hmm. And that is really neat to get to hear, I mean, a firsthand account from, from you on exactly how that worked, what happened, and I can really appreciate that because there's a lot mm -hmm. of people that discuss it and go back and forth about the ping, and so that's really neat to know. Something else, uh, people talk about the M1 thong. 
Yes. Yeah. Well, it, it wasn't given so much for loading the gun when they were being inspected, you know, uh, by their officers, they were told to rack the operating rod back, lock the bolt back. Mm -hmm. And then when the officer said, okay, they were supposed to pull the bolt back, push the follower down and let the bolt go. Right. If you didn't get your thumb out of the way, you got them one thumb to load them. It's a different deal. You know, your, your thumb is never there. I'm not going to load this thing in the house here, but I'm just going to show you. Uh, you push it down. Your thumb is never really in the way. You get the cartridges in there. Right. So the M1 thumb came more from inspections, like just like this. See? Gotcha. That makes sense. And that's something we can show on the range, perhaps, when we take these mm -hmm. out and get to shoot them. And in movies I've seen, you show a guy shooting a grand, he brings it down to load, gets his clip out, and pushes it in, right? Right. Well, it makes a lot more sense in combat to keep your eye on what's happening, pull your clip out, and push it in from the top with your fingers. See? Like that. Like that. And that way, nobody's coming up at you while you're reloading your rifle. See? Right. Yeah. You know, so there's, hmm. th that's just a couple little things people have told me, veterans have told me. And so that's how they would load in mm -hmm. a combat scene. Now, that's yeah. another interesting tidbit that you yeah. don't really hear much about. Keep, keep your eyes out for danger. Yeah. See. I'm going to have to try that because I'll, I'll be honest with you. Every time I load them, I do the old thumb, yeah. you know, right along here, push the clip in. So I'm going to have to try that hook method and push it. That'll be yeah. cool. you got to get your fingers out of the way, though. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. Most bolts on grands will stay back. Put the ammo in it and then slap the bolt and it'll go forward. Mine, so I have an M1 and mine's like that. that that's right. Most of them will stay back. Uh, these two rifles, my own, these are my only two grands, although I've had many others. Both of these are World War II. That's the Springfield Arsenal Armory. Springfield Armory. Right. This is Winchester. Uh, that one, the Springfield gun, came with the, the later site, post-World War II site. I found that on eBay and had it put on there so the gun would be all World War II. The stock looks like it's in magnificent condition because it is. Uh, according to Bruce Canfield's book, stocks with the stampings like that one were made in World War II, but they were made as replacement stocks to be used later. So uh -huh. there's no telling when that stock actually was put on that rifle. Otherwise, it's, it's pretty much all, all of World War II. This Winchester is all Winchester. Uh, Which uh, is kind of rare, as it, you were saying. Very rare. A friend got it. Uh, he had buddies at the CMP. They would throw Winchester parts aside for him. And he put together an all Winchester mm. one. Uh, I've shot this one the most. And it's, it's reasonably accurate. It's not, you know, it's a three minute of angle rifle. Okay. 100 yards. That one I've shot very little. And... It's less than two minutes of angle rifle. It's a very wow. good shooting rifle. So it's, it shoots as good as it looks then? Yes. <laughs> and there's a caveat to that. And that is that you have to have good ammunition. Mm, for sure. A lot of military ammunition is just so-so. But if you load your own or buy some of the special stuff that uh, Hornady makes or used to make, I'm not sure, Federal makes a uh, special M1 Garand oh. load. Uh, they shoot pretty good. Of course, I prefer my own. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of your own, you must have a, a particular load for these, especially given there's some special considerations when it comes yeah. to hand loading. You don't want to try to make a 30, 300 Magnum out of these. <laughs> that That's stupid. Don't need it anyway. They're, they were made for a velocity of about 2,700 feet per second with a bullet weighing about 150 grains. So that's what I go for. Okay. And, you know, a 30 out 6 in a bolt action, you can go up to over 2,900 feet per second with that weight of bullet. You don't need to with these. In fact, you'll damage the operating rod with these if you get too reckless with them. I like Varget powder. 
Okay. Uh, IMR4895 was actually developed for these guns. Really? Yes, that was what the, they were tested with and made for. And I like it. If I could, didn't have a, a can of Vargas on hand, I'd use 4895. Okay. I use about 46, 47 grains of it, uh, 46 usually, any 150 to 155 grain bullet. If, if I'm going for accuracy, I used 155 grain hollow point boat tails. If I'm going to shoot at chunks of firewood like we might do, <laughs> uh, 150 grain sporting bullets, they're just fine. Okay, very good to know. There's one other thing that a lot of people don't know about the M1 Garand. Uh, they'll criticize John Garand for taking so long to develop this because he worked, started working on it in the 1920s. It wasn't adopted by the US military until 1936. So why did it take him so long? <laughs> it took him so long because in the beginning he designed it for a cartridge called the 276. I've heard of that, uh, yes. I've got a full box of them around here somewhere. Oh. It, uh, it's a, actually a seven millimeter Mauser bullet, not seven millimeter Mauser, seven millimeter bullet. Oh, okay. It's a smaller case. The case as close as I can determine is very similar to the 6.5 Italian Carcano case. Oh, okay. So it's a smaller diameter, smaller, uh, shorter case. And John C. Garan got these ready with that ammunition, already tested by the Army. General Douglas MacArthur was the chief of staff for the Army at that time. Mm -hmm. And he says, no, we've got billions of rounds of .30-06 on hand. He said, I want that rifle to shoot .30-06. That's probably one of the few good decisions MacArthur ever made, in my opinion. And John C. Garan went back to the drawing board, redesigned it to shoot 30 out 6, and then the Army finally accepted it in 1936. Which is still way ahead of many other foreign militaries. That's exactly the case. And what surprised me was when I learned that even they started adopting it in 1936. They didn't get but 40,000 of them out by 1940. Oh, wow. That's pretty slow That's, production. But yeah. it was the Depression, things weren't going good. Uh, when war started in Europe, they got on the stick and then they started making them full tilt. Mm -hmm. The early ones were called a gas trap. They had a little fixture out here that bled the gas off and operated the system. You know, this is gas operated. Right. Uh, they didn't want to drill holes in the barrel to bleed off gas, so they trapped it at the end. Well, somebody finally figured out that you could drill a hole in a barrel and it didn't hurt the accuracy at all, <laughs> see, if you did it right. Right. And then they brought back most of the gas trap M1s and converted them to this. I've only actually seen one gas trap. Really? Uh, you know, a few of them got away from them and didn't get converted. Okay. I've only seen one. I, I re dearly wanted to photograph it, but I didn't get a chance. Mm -hmm. uh, so most grands are like this. They have the, the port, the piston operation under them, uh, and it works to perfection. The only time I've ever heard of M1 grands given functioning problems to troops was in the black sand, which is actually volcanic ash on Iwo Jima. Uh -huh. That stuff would gum up anything. And so... They had to clean them quite often on Iwo Jima. On Iwo Jima. Mm -hmm. well, that's the only, for, I mean, this rifle served in the Europe, it served in Africa, it served in the Pacific, and only on that one instance do you ever hear of a major malfunction. That's right. Uh, that's, that's very impressive. Of course, everything mal malfunctioned on Iwo Jima. Yeah, uh, yeah. So even, that... <laughs> even bolt action rifles had troubles. Wow. Yeah. Well, then that's no fault to the rifle then, that's right? That's right. Very fine rifles. Cleaning them, sadly have to do them from the muzzle. That's why uh, there's devices made to measure muzzle wear. And that's not from shooting so much, it's from cleaning. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Another thing I don't like about it is to actually clean it, you have to take it out of the stock. Mm. You know, you dismantle it. Uh, I'm a uh, mechanical nut. Uh, loser. 
when it comes to mechanics. <laughs> Mechanically uh, challenged? That's what I am. <laughs> I have to have the manual hate... right here to take one apart or I'll fumble around with it for an hour. Well, I, I can so, sympathize with yeah, you there. I'm, yeah. I'm not very good at that either. So but They darn sure trained their troops to get them apart and clean them and get them back together. They, they could do it in the dark. The wow. Marine Corps, the Army. They knew how to care for them. Mm -hmm. if, I'm trying to remember the exact quote. You probably know it better than I do, but uh, what General Patton said about the M1. Yeah, it says, the best battle implement ever devised. Yeah. That's quite a compliment coming from him. That's right. He didn't give out compliments real easy. No, he didn't. <laughs> he didn't. But they're fine rifles. I'm glad I've got these two. Uh, I doubt if I'll ever have another one, but these aren't going anywhere as long as I'm alive. No, I don't blame you. Mm -hmm. They're both. This one is in excellent condition. That's one of the, yeah. the nicest grands I've ever seen in person. We'll, we'll take that one down to shoot. I suspect that one is more accurate than this, even though I haven't shot it enough to say that definitively, but we'll we'll take that one down and work with it. Well, that sounds great to me. We've yeah. covered the hand loading and the care. Let's yeah. go down in the range and shoot. Yeah, we'll plink with that. Sounds good. So we have the M1 Grand benched in, targets down range at 100 yards, and Mike is gonna spot for me. You all set, Mike? Spotter's on. All right. Well, let's send some rounds down range. I'm trying that, uh, yeah, push that harder. method. There it is. There you go. There we go. <laughs> Take a little practice to do that under stress. You're on it. High center. High center. Or high, right, slight, slightly. Right, slightly. Could be me. Okay, you're high right. High right, okay. See if I can walk it down. That's more centered. Hit the third bullet's mark, right on. Right on. Right with the last two. Okay. Right with them, you're forming a group now. That's right on one of those other marks. That's a five shot group of about two and a half inches. I will take that. Might as well shoot it till that embark loader flies out. Sounds good to me. Gotta hear the ping. There it went. And I hit on that last one, right? You got a triangular, triangular group of six rounds uh, at the most, it's three inches. All right. I, it's probably not that far. And the first two, I kind of dropped the sights down to try and center that. So I'll, I'll take that. That's not bad. Not bad yeah. at all. It settled in, or you settled in, one of the two, at, <laughs> after two shots. And it formed a group then. Very nice. You know, I really like the sights on the M1. They just, they line up really nicely. I always get a good cheek weld. And granted, this... The M1s, I've probably had the most trigger time behind one of these out of any of the rifles or firearms we shot today. Well, they were a wonderful battle rifle. They weren't perfect, but they were pretty darn good. Yeah, I, I would say so. And it must have been a huge advantage to have eight rounds in a semi-automatic rifle compared to everybody else that was using, you know, bolt actions and five-round stripper clips, mm -hmm. or maybe six if you were from Italy, but. Well, the official doctrine of the German army 
was to use bolt action rifles with the MG42 in the center and use the rifles to move people into the firing lane. With the United States, they had the 1919 machine gun in the center and the doctrine was to push people out where the infantrymen with M1 Garands could engage them. Hmm. And I imagine a soldier with an M1 would be a little bit more effective than one with a Mauser bolt action rifle. Correct. Very cool. So we're back from the range now after shooting all of these infantry rifles individually and we'll have separate videos covering each of these. But I thought for the end of each of those we'd talk about them as a whole and kind of compare and contrast. And you may notice that one of these infantry rifles is missing. And that would be the 1903 Springfield. We just didn't lay it on this table because everybody that shoots to one degree or the other has to know that Springfields are fine rifles. And they proved that to us again. They, it sure did. You know, I was very impressed with the accuracy of the 1903 Springfield and you almost kind of come to expect it. I mean, so long as the barrel looks good, it's going to shoot good. That's it. And uh, another surprising factor though was this 1917. These things get a bad rap. The Springfields are known for their accuracy and the Enfields are known for being mediocre. Well, there are mediocre. Enfields, although this isn't really an infield, it's a US 1917. You got me calling them infields again, I, Jeremiah. I'm starting you on a bad habit, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> These 1917s are fine rifles. Uh, this thing shot just as good as you could expect most sporting rifles to shoot. The quality is excellent. This is made by Remington, by the way. Winchester made them and then a subsidiary of Remington made them that was called Eddie Stone. The Remingtons are fine rifles and it we proved that when Jeremiah was shooting them on paper or on the steel targets. Yeah, I was really impressed with it. And uh, as far as the sights go, the sights I actually kind of prefer these sights mm -hmm. a little bit over the 1903 Springfield sights. Not mm -hmm. to say I couldn't hit or didn't shoot well with the 1903, but these are nice sights. They're good sights that were British designed. Yeah. Uh, I hate to give them much credit, but they, they did design the sights. Well, they designed the whole rifle. But uh, I pr much prefer these sights to open sights. Me too. Me too. And that's they're, they are a British designed rifle, and that's kind of where that Enfield name came along. That's right. Mm -hmm. But they are a 1917. It's good to clarify that. There's one thing I have to stress. Most people are going to look at this Carcano in here and say, what in the world are they doing with that? Those Carcanos are junk. Well, they're not. They got a bad rap worse than the Remingtons. Most people have been shooting junk ammo in them. It's 6.5 millimeter, so they're shooting 264, .264 diameter bullets in them. The Carcanos are made for .267 diameter bullets or 268 diameter bullets. How'd this one shoot for you? I was really impressed with it. Yeah. It's a clunky gun. It's no Springfield. It's no Mauser. But they will shoot. They are not junk. Well, you know, to make a comparison, even though we didn't shoot the Mosin uh, infantry rifle version, we did shoot the, uh, the short rifle, the carbine. Mm -hmm. The action, comparing the action and stuff and the workings of that, I would take the Carcano over the Mosin any mm -hmm. day. Mm -hmm. uh, in all honesty, mm -hmm. I really liked it. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, we have the darling of the U.S. military in World War II, the M1 mm -hmm. Grand. Yes, nobody can fault an M1 Grand. I think if you went around a bunch of World War II veterans and you made snide remarks about the Grand, you'd get beat up. Yeah, I, I, I believe it, and yeah. probably rightfully so. You know, yeah. it is an amazing rifle. And one thing we should really stress, these are old rifles. Mm -hmm. The 1903 sh that we shot on the range was 100 years old this year. And this 1917... Is at least 102 years old. At least 102. Could be 104. Mm -hmm. So they shot wonderfully, maybe not to your target rifle standards at Camp Perry, but compared to most American sporting rifles, they shot very well.
I agree. I was very happy, very surprised, especially with the Carcano and the Enfield. Like, those two were the, the big ones. Mm -hmm. So, on that note, we think we'll close this video, and uh, I want to thank you guys for watching. But I also want to thank Mike. You opened up your, your vault to us, your home, your range, your shooting shack, and you allowed us to come out here and film and show everyone just how neat these old World War II rifles are. Well, so I really appreciate that. Jeremiah, your enthusiasm has given me more enthusiasm. And I just want to thank you for being here. And I want to tell people, this young man is the future of guns and people like him. Well, thank you, Mike. That means a lot coming from you. And before I forget, I also want to note, if you want to learn more about these rifles, Mike has showed me so much just in the time that I've been here, and we haven't even been able to scratch the surface. There is so much more to these neat old rifles. You need to check out his book, Shooting World War II Small Arms. There is so much awesome information in there from the load data to the who manufactured it, the numbers produced. It's a great book. Be sure to check it out. And on that note, I'd like to ask you to give us a thumbs up if you like this video. And don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell icon so you're notified when we post our next video. And again, we'll have individual videos on all of those, so be sure to watch for those as they're released. And lastly, if you have any questions or comments, be sure to leave them in the comments section below. And then real quick, a special thank you to Ted Tompkins for being the official gopher, mm -hmm. running around and getting us food and rifles and ammunition and whatever we needed to keep going. Also, a special thanks to Chris Downs, who filmed all this, and he's the official photographer and videographer for all of Handloader TV. And another thanks to Don Polachek, the owner of Wolf Publishing, who makes it possible for us to bring this information to you in the video format. Thank you so much, and we'll catch you in the next episode. Mm -hmm.